There's people out there who need to hear the gospel. And I'm going to go out there, even if, uh, even if they're not ready for me, even though it may be an obscure place, even though there's not anyone there to receive me, I sure want to go there. I, I'd love to see what God would do. And so that was the Apostle Paul's attitude. He would go anywhere. Well, good evening. So good to be back with you. I do feel somewhat sad for you because you don't get to see the best part of our missionary team. My wife and my kids are in Uruguay right now, so I would love if you picked up a prayer card of mine, of ours, and you can pray for all of us. Uh, you had the privilege of meeting my wife uh, years ago when we were here and uh, at another missions conference. Uh, I really think they're the best part of the team, I really do. Uh, I got a head start. My dad is from Uruguay, my mom is from Argentina, so I grew up speaking Spanish at home. They, uh, they're the real missionaries. They had to learn Spanish. They learned a little bit from me, but uh, they really learned it there. So I'm proud of them. They're good people. My wife does a lot of the things that normal missionary wives and pastor's wives do. She takes care of the loose ends. She teaches the Sunday school children. She does a lot of the administrative things, like making sure I have orders of service and things like that. Uh, my daughter teaches, uh, or she teaches uh, music, but another thing she does is she, uh, she uses her music in church, and she teaches Sunday school. My son does a lot of the sound and that sort of thing in church, and he, since I've been gone, uh, he's been teaching some Sunday school for the, for the kids. The boys really like that, and he's been leading singing. While I've been gone, I'm, I'm quite blessed there's a, a man you saw in that video, his name's Daniel. He's been doing some of the preaching for me. He, um, he preached this last week. And there's some other uh, Uruguayans there. One is an hour and a half away. The other, the other one is two and a half hours away. And they come to our church, and uh, they're continuing to have services on Sunday. And so I praise the Lord for that. Um, yeah, and so I want to thank you, for first of all, for supporting us uh, and being so kind that way to us. Um, and for the nice place... Uh, you put me up in a nice, a nice restful ho hotel, and thank you for that. And so I'm honored to represent the Lord in Uruguay uh, because of what your church is doing. So I, I firmly believe I've, I've supported missions since I uh, understood how missions works, how the nuts and bolts, the logistics of it works. And so uh, I gave to missions long before I was a missionary uh, because I thought it was right. God's heart is to get people saved. God's heart is for people to hear the gospel. And so I wanted to have a part in what other missionaries were doing. There's, I'm not going to be in most places in the world, but I knew that if I could contribute to missions, I could have a small part of what God is doing elsewhere. And for those of you who are contributing to missions, uh, most of you will probably never get to Uruguay. If you ever do, I'll treat you well. I'll feed you some good food. I'll show you around. But if you never make it, I guarantee you, if you're saved and you contribute to missions, you're going to meet some Salteños in heaven one day. And I think that would be a beautiful reunion, wouldn't uh, you? Oh, the Apostle Paul said he has a debt. And uh, there are some, if you give to missions, there will be some people who will be able to look you in the face and be indebted to you because of what you allowed the Lord to do in your life. And I think that's pretty special. My uh, grandfather accepted uh, the Lord Jesus Christ in Brazil. I know where it happened. I even know what church it happened in. But I don't know who did it. I've never met the man but one day I'd like to. It'll be a special reunion in heaven for me. And so I firmly believe there will be Salteño, Uruguayan people um, who you know, who you'll, you'll know in heaven who you've never met before. Uh, so where we serve is a city called Salto in Uruguay. Um, my wife's name is Trisha. My daughter's Josephine. She's 20. My son is 22. Uh, they both teach. My daughter teaches music. My son teaches English and Taekwondo, and they both study music. They're going to graduate from conservatory this year. Joshua will gra graduate in viola and her in uh, violin, and uh, they're doing very well. They keep very busy. We're, uh, three of us are Uruguayan citizens, so that helped a little bit during COVID when there was all kinds of border issues, and hopefully my wife will get her citizenship. Thank you for those of you who are praying for my wife's health. Uh, she's recovered, recovering. And so uh, she's getting better since the surgery she, she's had, and I get to see her soon. So I'm pretty excited about that. So in just, uh, you guys are one of my final meetings, and I get to go back to Uruguay and, and do what I, what I need to be doing there and serve the Lord there at, uh, in Salto and be with my family. So if, for those of you who don't know where Uruguay is, we put a little map on the uh, prayer card. So it's between 
Argentina and Brazil. And uh, where I am is, is right on the Argentine border. Where I live, I can see Argentina. And so if I go north about an hour and a half, I get to Brazil. And so I've been able to preach there, preach in a few different towns in uh, Uruguay. But we, we're concentrating and trying to get a church started in Salto. Uruguay is very secular. It's very European. It's the most secular country in the Western Hemisphere. They're the first country, or they're either the first or second country in Latin America to fully legalize um, marijuana. They were the first country in the world to fully legalize marijuana. They were the first, country, first or second country in Latin America to legalize same-sex marriage and abortion. And right now they're going through uh, euthanasia. They've gone through one reading to uh, allow euthanasia in the country. And there are some sensible politicians who are saying instead of worrying about uh, euthanizing people and killing people, maybe we should fix our health care. Maybe we should have some compassion to people, and that's good. I learned a statistic recently that the majority of people, the majority of elderly and disabled people are against euthanasia. That's pretty disturbing, because what that means is it's a bunch of healthy people telling a bunch of sick people the best thing they should do is die. And so there's people in Uruguay who are concerned about that, and I think there's people in Canada who should be concerned about that. And I think it was said earlier tonight, Jesus is the answer. Uh, I think if people get saved, then all of a sudden abortion isn't such an issue because people want to live pure lives. Euthanasia won't be such an issue either because people will want to be compassionate and love others and care for others and believe in life instead of death. Marijuana won't be such a big issue because why would you want to lose your mind when life is good, when God is good? And we can have his peace. The, what is the result of all this thinking and all this progressive ideas in Uruguay? They have the highest suicide rate in Latin America and the highest suicide rate for seniors in the world. And so I firmly believe what was said earlier, Jesus is the answer. If people get saved, all those things take care of themselves. We're going to read about the Apostle Paul shortly. Um, and the Apostle Paul, everything he did was gospel-centered. Everything was gospel-centered. Everything centered about what the gospel was, what Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection did for, uh, for the whole world. For the unbeliever, it's that Jesus Christ, from eternity past, looked down at this world. God the Son looked at the sinful world and said, and saw liars and cheaters and thieves and people who are dishonest, one with another. And he just saw a sinful humanity and said, I want to go down there and I want to go take their place. I know I want to go down there and I want to be, and I know that I'm going to be beaten, I'm going to be mocked and maligned, I'm going to be ignored and ridiculed, I'm going to be uh, abused so badly and whipped so badly that my own mother won't be able to recognize me, and I want to do that. Because if I don't do that, then this world is eternally condemned. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, and so because we all have that sin debt, because every man, woman, boy, and girl has a sin debt, Jesus came to pay that price on the cross. And that's the beauty of the gospel, is that he took the place of anyone who will accept that gift, that life. He took anyone's place. So the, the rest of the beauty of the gospel is for the believer. Uh, and that's huge. I have the power to live daily. I have the power to live in victory daily because of what Jesus did. And I think, I think the root of all sin is pride. And so, because if someone won't get saved, if someone uh, will get saved rather, uh, they have to have a humble enough attitude to say, God, you're smarter than I am. Lord, I need you. God, I do have a problem. I do have a sin problem. I can't do this on my own. God, would you help me? God, would you save me? And God will accept that soul. But if somebody's proud and says, I'm going to do this on my own, I'm fine, thank you very much, then God can't save that soul because there's pride there. So salvation is once and for all, and I think a key is for someone to have that attitude of humility and just be shown and just understood. And, and I, I've, been, I've been very encouraged already today. A lot of work has been put in to prepare for this missions conference. That's exciting. When I see a bunch, a bunch of flags go up and some nice videos and some nice singing, that, uh, that I don't see that and say, oh wow, there's some talented people or some thoughtful people. Although that, that's certainly true. I see there's some people who want to get the message of missions across, who want to celebrate God and what God wants to do. Yeah, that's exciting. And so God's will is for every, everyone to be saved. I and mean, that's, that's the key ingredient for missions there. So 
I won't say any more about uh, Uruguay tonight, but if you'll turn with me to Acts chapter 20, every time the Apostle Paul spoke, or rather every transcript, every speech the Apostle Paul ever gave was written in the book of Acts. And every single time, I marvel at this, he always gave the gospel. Always. You know, the Apostle Paul had times where he was being interrogated and he was in danger either for his life or in danger of punishment. And you know what he replied with? The gospel and the resurrection. He did that in the Roman court. He did that in front of the Sanhedrin. I would think that if you were in the midst of getting in trouble, it would probably not be the most natural thing for you to give the gospel. And yet it was for the Apostle Paul. That was always close to him. When he was imprisoned, he said, you know why I'm here? Because of the gospel. Because I believe it. That's the only reason I'm here. So the gospel was central to everything the Apostle Paul said, especially if we look at the book of Acts. And I, uh, you, you can't get away from the Apostle Paul when we're looking at Acts. I, I took a Bible course years ago. It was called The Life of Paul. And it was just a study of the book of Acts. The book of Acts is really his biography. If we want to understand how church, how Christians are supposed to live, we need to really know the Apostle Paul. What did he do? What did he teach us? What was his heart? Uh, and so there's three points I'm going to go through tonight. Uh, the Apostle Paul was willing to go anywhere. He was willing to gab with anyone. And he was willing to give anything. And so we're going to read Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 16. The Apostle Paul had four sermons, the only four sermons transcribed in the whole Bible, and they're all in the book of Acts. He had four other discourses transcribed as well, public discourses. Uh, this is the only sermon he ever gave to, or the only transcribed sermon, the only copy of a sermon that we have of his ever given to Christians. So it's kind of a special message, and uh, special especially in light of a missions conference. Acts chapter 20, verses 16 for Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hasted if it were possible for him to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him onto the ship. So a little bit of background there. Paul really wanted to go to Jerusalem. There was a feast he really wanted to get to. And so uh, the, the ship 
that he tended to take ships that made a lot of stops. That's just the way things were back then. And so instead of going inland to Ephesus, he, uh, he asked the men of Ephesus, these were men who, these were all Christian men, these were all elders of churches, these were pastors, and these were either people who he ordained into the ministry, or maybe Timothy ordained them. But if we look back, the Apostle Paul spent three years there. So not only did he teach some of these men and mentor some of these men and show them, uh, not only teach them the faith, but show them how they ought to live, how they ought to pastor, they could see him, and they knew how he lived. And so it was important enough, he knew he wasn't going to see them again. He knew he was going to die. And it was important to, for him to talk to these folks one last time before he was going to go. And it was a very emotional meeting. Paul was often, Paul was a, a very amazing fellow. Sometimes he preached very passionately. Here he mentions tears twice. And at, there at the end, I think the average Middle Eastern man in the first century or... or uh, <laughs> Mediterranean man in the first century was probably pretty manly compared to Canadian men today. That's just what I, how I picture it. Uh, but yet you see at the end of it there, they all wept sore. You know, they loved Paul, and Paul loved them. Uh, and they knew what he was saying was true. And so that's a little bit of the background. And so he knows it's important. He doesn't want to miss his, his meeting in Jerusalem. So he says, instead of me going all the way up into Ephesus, because you know, I think that, uh, you know, I read in the Bible, I think Christians in the first century weren't very different from how Baptists are today in some ways. They, they like to eat, they like to visit. When Paul was in Troas, they, uh, it, it seems like they had communion there. And then after uh, he raises that young man from the dead, they, they eat again and they hang out until the morning. So I think Paul kind of thought, if, if I go into Ephesus, you guys are going to feed me, you're going to treat me good, we're going to visit but I really need to get to Jerusalem. So instead of going into Ephesus, he says, meet me in Miletus. And right there on the shore, uh, as they're parting, he just kneels on, the, kneels on the sand there. And right on the sand, they just pray for God's will to be done. That was really special uh, tonight, just having that time of prayer. Do you think prayer does something? I really expect that God will do something uh, because of the prayers made here. So Paul was willing to go anywhere. Uh, and I think he proved that. There... Uh, Paul was an important fellow. I think the, the Apostle Paul spoke five languages. The Bible only says he spoke two. Uh, it says that he spoke Greek and Hebrew. But it was common for Jews in the first century, after the dispersion, for them to speak Aramaic. So he probably spoke Aramaic. He was in Roman court a lot. Uh, and so they spoke Latin. And he lived in Antioch. And in Antioch, they would have spoken Syrian. So I, I think he would have been fluent, or at least been able to get by in, in five languages, uh, he was educated by one of the most important men in the world. Uh, there was only five men given the title Rabban in, in Jewish literature, and Gamaliel was one of them. That was his teacher. That was his professor. That was his university, you could say. Paul was either part of the Sanhedrin or intimately associated with them. So he, he, was a, he would have been a wealthy man. He would have been an important man. And yet, none of that was important to him because he went to the most obscure places to be ignored and abandoned by men, and he was okay with that because he was following his Lord. He, he felt the same thing, and he, and he said the same thing we've already heard tonight. There's people out there who need to hear the gospel, and I'm going to go out there, even if, uh, even if they're not ready for me, even though it may be an obscure place, even though there's not anyone there to receive me, I sure want to go there. I, I'd love to see what God would do. And so that was the Apostle Paul's attitude. He would go anywhere. There was a time under, uh, that he spent waiting for a trial with Felix. He spent two years there. He was far away. He was in Caesarea. He was far away from his friends. He would never wrote an epistle there. It would have been easy to feel forgotten. It would have been easy to get bitter. And yet you don't see any evidence of that. He just trusted his Lord. Paul has got a very good lesson for you and I. He trusted God. And as I said, there's times where the Apostle Paul preaches with a whole bunch of passion, and there's times that Paul just preaches very calm and collectedly. Like when he preached in Athens, he just logically steps, sets out why uh, the, the, the God of the Bible is the true God compared to the idols of this world. But there were some times he was very passionate as well. But there was, there was times where he was really calm. You know, there's a, there's a portion in the Bible where Paul gets slapped in the face in front of the Sanhedrin, you know what he does? 
he responds with Scripture. Somebody slapped you in the face, would you respond with Scripture? I think he could be that kind of, that, have that kind of calm, not because he just had that demeanor, but because he knew he was following God's will the best way he knew how, and God would take care of it. There was another time where Paul was just about being executed, just about executed, and he just t- told people from the steps there after the soldiers rescued him, he gave his testimony, he talked about Jesus. Paul was willing to go anywhere, and he trusted his Lord. The um, Acts is, like I said, a, a biography of the Apostle Paul, and everywhere he went, he faced opposition. You know, Paul says something twice in the Bible, a statement that I find fascinating. He says, save some. It says that twice in the Bible. You know, everywhere, I can't think of a single place in the Bible where the Apostle Paul went where he didn't face enemies, where he didn't face rejection. I can't think of a single place he went to where everyone was happy to see him. He always faced rejection. And if it wasn't there to meet him, they sent rejection his way. There were people following, to make, following him <laughs> to try and get rid of him. And, you know, he wasn't concerned about the majority rejecting him. He was concerned that he could save some. If you're a Christian, get used to most people rejecting you. That's kind of a negative statement, isn't it? No, but it's true. It's true. If you love the Lord, most people, they're, they're not going to treat you right. But you know what? You, you go on anyway. Because Paul was concerned that he'd save some. And you just be patient. You walk with God. I remember I, I was a tradesman before I became a missionary. And I remember I, I would uh, take my Bible. I would take my Bible to work and put it on my lunch where I ate my lunch. And I'd leave it open there and I'd read my Bible. And I remember one man one time came up to me and said, Is that a Bible? Yeah, that's a Bible. Do you believe that? I believe every, I believe every word of it. And he just started laughing hysterical at me right, hysterically at me right there. And I thought, this is weird. And so, you know, he's trying to mock that, I guess, believing the Bible is ridiculous. A man got saved on that job site. You just love people, and you, you trust that if someone maligns you, you just keep loving your Lord. Because you're not there to serve people. You know, just like Hudson Taylor said in that video, he was there, although he loved China, he was there to serve Christ. And that ought to be our, our impetus, our, our movement. So Paul was able to be calm, be peaceful, because he trusted his Lord. He was willing to go anywhere because of that. He was also willing to gab with anyone. He was able and willing to talk with all kinds of people. You know, I think sometimes I don't talk and you don't talk to people about Jesus because of a fear of man. That happens. And it, it shouldn't happen that way. Somebody uh, once said, uh, describing uh, commercialized Christmas, that, that commercialized Christmas is uh, giving gifts you can't afford to people who don't need them. And there's probably some truth to that. But I think being fearful of what people think about Jesus uh, and being concerned what they think is, is, uh, is paying deference to those who don't care for you. You know, oftentimes we'll be concerned about people who really don't have the best, our, our best interests in mind. We should love folks enough to tell them about our Lord. Paul didn't have that issue. He didn't have a, a fear of man. He faced all kinds of important people, and he could tell them about Jesus. He could be in a courtroom, and he would say, the only reason I'm here is because of Jesus and the resurrection. So when God tells us to witness to someone, we have to, we have to realize that's God speaking. If God is speaking to you to do something, you should be thankful that God hasn't given up on you. So when God speaks to you and, and says, you know, you need to talk to this person, you need to submit because keep that line open with God. If the Lord is speaking to you or bringing something to your mind, thank the Lord for speaking to you and, and obey that and, and surrender to that. Because God's done everything for you. There's a, a pastor I met uh, a few years ago, and I say this, it's, it's good for us to, uh, to battle our flesh. And a fear of man is just that. It's giving in to our flesh. Instead of talking to people about Jesus, say, saying whatever it is, I'm too tired, uh, I don't have a tract on me, whatever. Instead of saying that, saying, okay, Lord, I'll talk to them. Uh, there's a pastor I know who, uh, he does a lot of scripture signs. And he'll go on a street corner some afternoons and he'll, he'll just stand on the street with a sign, just, a, just some nice Bible verses. And uh, I talk to him, he, he really loves his Lord. And he goes out there and I ask him, 
you know, how does that work? Do you see much fruit? He says, no, some people wave, a lot of people ignore me. And I said, well, okay, that's good. And he said, but sometimes I need to do that. I need to do this. I need to go out there and get in public for my Lord because sometimes I can feel my flesh growing. I don't like it. And uh, standing out there with a Bible verse, it keeps me humble. He's a good pastor. I, he's got a small church, but I don't think I've ever been in a church where more people go soul winning. The majority of the church comes out to tell people about Jesus. And that pastor says, just when my flesh starts getting, uh, when I feel it, that my Lord isn't the most important thing in my life, I, I just love standing on the street with that verse. That helps him. You know, if the Lord talks to you and you're ashamed of your Lord, you, you look your shame in the face and say, how dare you? You tell people about Jesus. You tell people about your Lord. And uh, that's why I think fasting is important. You know, just in passing, we, we ought to be able to tell our flesh <laughs> who's boss, right? And so when the Lord speaks to you, you listen to him. When he, when he wants you to do something that makes you uncomfortable, you go ahead and do it because your flesh is wrong. When the Lord speaks to you, you, you submit to that. You surrender that. Uh, and I, I, I passed in this, and we should be able to, I, I, talked, I just talked with Pastor uh, about uh, a fellow we both know who needs help, who's, who's not doing right. And I, I talked with him. You know, if you love someone, you tell them what, when they're doing wrong. Not in a mean way, but you, you befriend them. Paul talked to his own men here, his own preachers. Do you, you see what he said to them here? Wolves. I don't know that he knew which ones. And apparently they all loved him because at the end they all wept sore. But he said, some of you are going to become wolves. You're going to seek a gathering. You're going to start believing false doctrine. And I think he said it lovingly, or else he wouldn't have hugged and cried with them at the end. If you see someone you, you know doing wrong, you love them but you tell them they're doing wrong. And the Apostle Paul had that kind of attitude that uh, he was willing to, to gab with anyone. And lastly, the Apostle Paul was willing to give anything. These people, when you live with someone for a while, and when you watch with someone for a while, you get the privilege of not only hearing what they preach or what they tell you, you get the privilege of seeing what they, how they live. My dad never sat me down to teach me something formally. But I learned so much from my dad. And you learn a lot from watching someone. You can tell people about Jesus, but people will learn a lot about Jesus from watching you. And the Apostle Paul worked among these people, lived with these people. There's one thing, I, I remember uh, my pastor, there was a family in our church, I, I heard a phrase lately that's just been coming to mind a lot, hurt people, hurt people. And I remember there was a family in our church who was real, really a mess. Uh, they had a lot of issues, and my, my wife and I really tried to befriend them and be kind to them, and so did our pastor. And then things just kind of exploded. It got very ugly, and they were slanderous and, and mean to our pastor and mean to us. And uh, it just got really ugly. And they were just gossiping all kinds of false things to people. And then I found out from, I found out from my wife, because she was talking with this lady afterwards, that our pastor went to these people alone afterwards and helped them financially. And out of, like personally, not with church money. And uh, I thought with a fair bit of money. And I thought, how could you help such lousy people? I, I thought that about pastor. How could you be so good to people who are so bad? You know, but he taught me something. Christ didn't come for good people, did he? If you're saved, God didn't hit the jackpot when you accepted him. You know, he saved a sinner. He looked at something dirty and sinful and said, I'll, I'll save you, I can, I can save that. And I remember our Lord Jesus Christ, I don't know if you recall what he said to Judas at the moment of his betrayal. He called him friend. My, my Lord Jesus isn't a liar. He can look at, at more than likely the most wickedest man who ever lived and look him in the face and say, friend. And so I learned something from watching my pastor that we should love people who aren't very loving. You know, God is love. The Bible says God is love, but, it, but it's not because you're lovable. It's because he, he can look at sinful people and love them in, in spite of that. And so the Apostle Paul 
left a good example for these folks. He was willing to, uh, he was willing to uh, be loving to folks. He was willing to be a giver. And we see that in, uh, in these verses. In verse 32, he obviously lived for heaven. He looked for an inheritance in heaven, not here on earth. He wasn't materialistic. In verse 3, he said he, he never coveted man's gold, silver. It says in the next verse, he worked hard. And not only hard enough to support himself, hard enough so that he could help others. He was generous. He's telling this to people who've watched him for years. So they know what he's like. He was a giver. He gave willingly. And uh, I, I really believe God is for missions in this sense that when you give a tithe, what you give, like I, I've, I've taught this to my folks in Uruguay, when you give a tithe, all you're doing is getting the benefit of having a, a church and, and reaping the benefit of being a church. A, a Christian who tithes, you know, praise the Lord if you're tithing, but that doesn't make you a good Christian. That just means you're, you're paying your way. But what missions is, is me giving towards something that I'll never see the benefit of. I've given, I've given money to missions. I'm never going to reap the benefit. I'm never going to see what's other than a prayer letter. I'm never going to see what that does. Someday I will. And that's why missions giving proves my heart. Because it's a tithe, I'll say this, a tithe in that sense isn't selfless giving. Because you give a tithe, but then you get the benefit of being in church. Isn't that good? But when you give to missions, you're truly being generous. Our Lord is generous, isn't he? And so a mi missions giving is giving towards something that you'll never reap a benefit of on this world. Maybe you will. You, know, may, there, there may be, you may travel to some places where you get to see the benefit of, of what you've given towards, but you won't see most of them. You've got 108 missionaries? You guys, you guys won't go to 108 places. I'd like to trade places with you if you're going to go to 108 places. That'd be special. But... Uh, but you will only one day, only in heaven, will you see the benefit of what God does with that. So missions giving is truly a show of, of generosity. The Apostle Paul was generous. He was a giver. And the people knew it. He wasn't talking to people who didn't know him. He was talking to people who, who watched him for three years. It was, a free, uh, he, it was a free will offering. And then in verse 35, I also see here that... He talks about giving here, but he also teaches something. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. You won't know Jesus as well. And I, I, I believe there, there are some things we experience in the Christian life we can only get through obedience. And I think giving is one of them. There are things in my life I can praise the Lord for because I've taken steps of faith. And I think missions giving is just one of those things. So this is the Apostle Paul speaking specifically to Christians and the, some of the testimonies he gives to them, this, this passionate uh, message he gives to them is that he was willing to go anywhere, that he was willing to gab with anyone, and he was willing to give anything. And I just want to leave you with those thoughts. Is there anything that you would hold on to? Is there anybody you wouldn't talk to about the Lord Jesus Christ? Is there anything you're not willing to do for him? You know, he was willing to do everything for you, Lord Jesus Christ was. But what would you do for him? Thank you for watching the message today. We invite you to join us again every Sunday and Wednesday for more inspiring messages from God's Word.